I'm off to meet dance music legend Rui De Silva. I started listening to dance music from the late 90s to 2000s. I wanted to sit down with him and work out the mechanics and principles of what goes behind a number one hit such as Touch Me. Hi guys, it's me Johnny Cassell and I am sat here today with the dance music legend Rui De Silva. Uh, it's an honor to have you uh, in, in my presence today. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's recently we've become good friends, I would say. You know, yes. it's, um, it's been awesome. I would say someone you know, who I've gr grew up listening to, to actually, you know, be mm, thank sat you. here right now. You know, <laughs> <laughs> thank sharing, you. Sharing this interview with it was fantastic. So, um, for those that, that are not familiar with Rui, um, you know, Rui was the number one, um, well, the only, the only Portuguese artist to reach a UK chart and be number one yeah, that's in, right. in, in, in history ever. And the, the track was Touch Me, yeah. uh, featuring the vocals of Cassandra. Yes. Uh, it was a huge hit. Um, so yeah, tell us a bit about like what you're kind of involved in, you know, what that allowed you to springboard into and tell us about Kismet Records. Yeah, well, Touch Me was uh, quite quite later on in uh, in my, my springboard. It, yes. all, it all started back in my home country in Portugal, and um, I was always kind of fascinated by music, and um, so I kind of trying to figure out how, what, what I could do with music. Not necessarily thinking about having a, a career in making music, but um, and I, I bought a, a bass guitar and I had like tried to find some like mine. Peers to, to make a band. We had like a garage band going on, I know the stories. and um, and then nobody would turn up to, for the rehearsal. So I was usually like go there with my bass, and that people didn't turn up because they were busy doing whatever they were doing. And I was kind of like a bit getting a bit frustrated. And then I was quite tech savvy at, uh, even back then, looking reading through magazines, what people were using, and discover that people were like. I was starting to listen to Kraftwerk and it's like people were making music they did not even needed other musicians and that's when I kind of switched on and I was like hang on a minute maybe I can do this yeah. and um, it was all about the music was nothing about the image which was something that was for me quite fascinating as well because that's where for me that's where the es essence of, of, of everything is it's in, it's in the music not in, in, in the image even that that's kind of slightly changed over the years now mm -hmm. But dance was, it's, at the end of the day, it's, you make a record for people to dance. They don't really care who it is. The record is for people to dance. So yeah. you need to make a record for people to dance. So I sold the bass, sold the, sold the amp, and bought a 909 and a, and a sampler machine and kind of start making some beats. Then um, tried to figure out how to do it. Uh, what do I need it to press some vinyl? So while you go about pressing vinyl, I discovered that, that you could just call it a company and ask them to cut your song to to an acetate and then take the acetate to a pl pressing plant and they will make you more vinyl and then when the next minute I'm s I've got like a thousand vinyls in my front room <laughs> trying to figure out what I'm going to do with them <laughs> and then um, I figured out that people that play in clubs go to DJs they go to to this shop in downtown Lisbon that was called Bimotura and that's where they buy some some of the records to play so I'll just Took a box, went down there, and said, "I've done this, this, this record now." They kind of liked it. There, there was a bunch of um, which became. There were really early days in, in Portugal. There was no no like dance scene like there is now all around the world. It so was you, the were, same. you were pioneering. It, yeah, we were pioneer, pioneering yeah. the scene. This is we're talking about like early nineties, mm -hmm. and um, so three of the DJs that were there, they were like, oh, "This kid just come in here." And, with a vinyl, pressing a record with like some dance beats that sound like coming out of US or U UK. So they kind of snapped me up and they're like, like, come and speak with me. So we kind of like got start getting, hanging out together, start putting parties in, in, in Portugal. So slowly evolved to creating a record label, to, to create a springboard for more artists and to kind of like fictitious creating a, a what looked like an industry or a scene. Mm -hmm. So we he looked to give it more an official uh, thing, but that kind of like motivated a lot of, a lot of other like-minded people that existed around in the, in the country to do the same thing. So all of a sudden, in a few years, there was quite a wealthy scene in terms of parties, um, DJs, producers. I was and watching another interview. And you 
you're saying you're throwing bloody big crazy parties in like castles. Stuff. Yeah, we started looking for venues. I was at the time working at a radio station, which was a news radio station. So I had a really good understanding of PR and how to push things and how to promote and, and reach an audience because mm -hmm. there was no internet. There was none of these. It was, it was, very, it was very, a very traditional way of doing it, either press, uh, traditional press or, or radio and sometimes TV. Um, and um, so I was kind of like helping on that front on the part. It's not, not more on the production, but more on, on, on the front of, of, of promotion. So we were quite successful. So one of, our, one of us would speak with a local council and get a license to throw a party, would be in a castle or in a convent or um, just really unique, unique uh, venues. And we start booking uh, international DJs like Danny Tenaglia, Sven Vat or uh, Tony Humphreys, Derek May, they all came to play wow. our parties. And there was, it was a tremendous buzz. Then after a few years, I kind of like felt that I needed a new challenge. You outgrew it? Sort of outgrew it yeah. to a certain extent. Um, my, my girlfriend, which is my wife at the time, she was living in Portugal and we were considering moving to New York. But then she got an offer of a job in, in London and we moved, we moved to England and I've sold my, my shares on, on the, the company I had in Portugal, was Chaos Records and arrived in London and started a new one, which is Kismet Records. And then from there, she was working at a, a nightclub, which doesn't exist anymore, uh, which was called Ohm. Mm -hmm. And um, Oakenfold used to play there, like a lot of DJs used to play there. Uh, I used to go and see Oki uh, play where, every... Where was Ohm's situation? Ohm was in Leicester Square, right. number, number one Leicester Square. Wow. And uh, this is like um, 98, 99, something so around there. And I was listening to him playing and I was like always thinking, oh, I need, I need, I've got this idea, I want to do a record for this guy, but I need to find a singer. And I've just been a couple of months in London, I really don't know so you, so you, where, where, so where to look for that, a singer. That's an so, <laughs> so you went to this gig, what, yeah. I used to go there, because, I used to go there regularly because my right. wife was, was working there, running the, the guest list for, uh, for the members bar. Right. And, um, and all the, the only thing going through your mind is how do I get? Yeah, <laughs> I was to play thinking, my record. Yeah, it's like yeah. I, I I can make a record for this guy. He's going to blow his mind off. Yeah, but I can't find a singer. I need to find a singer. And I said, where am I going to find a singer? And I was thinking, wandering around. I could make the music, but to really blow his mind off, I'm going to need to put some some song Someone on this. Great. Yeah. And then I always believe in this kind of like you send the energy to the universe, and then that energy comes back, and then you need to acknowledge it and act on it in a certain way so you can actually receive the benefits of what you, you've requested. Mm -hmm. And so I was walking to go and pick up Jill in, um, from her work near Leicester Square in, in Piccadilly Circus and there was this girl singing with a, with a band, just a little crowd around it and I was like, the old ears at the back of, of my neck were like up and I was like, wow. oh, what's this? And, um, and she was like singing some random song and it was just incredible, I was like, I need to get her number. And um, I, I approached her, and when she finished singing, she moved away, the band started playing. It looked like they, they didn't even know how to play. I was like, what was that that happened just there? And um, I got a number, she came down to the studio, and we kind of worked a couple of days, and that's how we created Touch Me, yeah. Wow. And then, to, to finish it off, we, I, when I finished the record, I sent it to Okafold at the time, I had a residency called Perfecto at uh, Pasha. Yeah. My, my friend was running um, as a musical director at Passion. I gave him a copy and on that night Oki heard the song and he played it five times in a row. Wow. You know, in the club, the, during the course of the night, he played it five times and just blew up like at the end of the summer. It was just like insane. What was going on with wow. that record was insane. It kind of like mission accomplished because I, I made a record for him to play and he actually played it five times in the same yeah. night. So, which is not the first time that, that that happened with a record of mine. It happened in the early 90s when I was still in Portugal. We did a record called Sogara by the Underground Sound of Lisbon. And the same thing, we gave a record to, to Junior Vasquez, which he used to run an, a club called, um, uh, what was it called? Uh, Sound Factory. And um, the same thing, that in those days, it was really difficult to, to know what records were what because you could only get it on vinyl and a friend, we, send a, we pressed it in Portugal, send, five co send one copy to, to, to New York to a friend of ours who used to go to the Sun Factory, gave it to Junior Vasquez. Junior Vasquez played that record several times um, in, the, in the course of the same night and then kept playing it every single weekend for months 
to the point that nobody knew what the record was. I mean, I've got still to, to the day of today, I get people that tell me how that record was like haunting them because they did not know it was. But a lot of people that used to go to Sun Factory in the early days from Terry Farley, uh, uh, Express 2, all, 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 all that, those, that crew, it's like this record has like blew their, their, their minds. And, no one um, had Shazam back then. No, they, that didn't <laughs> exist. And then eventually we, we kind of heard some, the guy, my, my, our friend never went back to Sun Factory because he, whatever reason, he, he, he was busy with his work. But eventually he went, he, we sent a few more copies saying, let's see what happens. And when he went there, there's, there was um, one, one of the guys that used to go there uh, regularly, Rob Di Stefano, used to run a, a label uh, called Tribal Records, but Danny Tenaglia and Deep Dish and Merck were all um, the main um, artists there. And he saw him, the same guy and said, hey, come here, can you give me the name of what this record is? And he got a phone number and then he, they eventually called Portugal on an international call on my birthday trying to figure out where, where, where is Portugal in the world because I can't really <laughs> figure it out. I said, well, it's in Europe. <laughs> And then from there, we kind of signed the record and, and that record as well, kind of is still, it's an, it's an iconic record. It's the record that has been most sampled, it's got in the Guinness World, world of Records as the most sampled um, record of all time. Really? Yeah. Why does more people know about this? <laughs> it's just insane. It's just, it's just, it's just insane. But, but it's, um, it, it, it's crazy. It's just. Uh, I haven't yeah, even it's, heard it myself. Yeah, it's, yeah, for sure. It's called yeah. So Get Up. It's been sampled. It's been sampled like, yeah, forever. Wow. <laughs> but, but the ori for me, it's all about the original. I mean, and it's, it's, um, it's um, a very long. It's another very long story, but it's an incredible story how the record came about and how it, it all happened. It, it totally shifted um, the, the, um, the label that came out because the at the time the label was, that was selling. On Chaos? No, that was original on Chaos, which yep. was my label. Then we licensed worldwide to Tribal America and that kind of, which was Tribal America and Tribal UK. That kind of shifted the label gears. They were selling X amount and then after that record they were selling like 10 times more on a, any release it was we, we, and it changed a lot of people's lives mm -hmm. so, so you know there's one thing about having you know an idea of you know having that moment of inspiration and you know think right I need to have you know someone play my track or you know I've got this idea of this and you know it's true that a lot of creative people you know, have, have amazing talents right but what the difference is is the execution of it, right? So, what what is that driving factor in you that, that is able to, you know, have that moment of inspiration, put all of your creative tools into place, and still push it out into the market? Yeah, I mean, I think you you need to have some sort of fearless and kind of like you almost need to disconnect and not. You cannot acknowledge what other people might judge from it. All you look, all you can see is I'm, I, I need to do. A, I mean, I need to do a record for this person to play because I, I heard him and I really like what he's doing, yeah. and I, I want to do something for him, and I'm not interested. And half so of it, you, you, half you of it will be noise. yeah, half, half of it will be naivety. Uh, the other half will be. Um, total disregard for rules or whatever it is. All you, all you can see is that I've seen this and I need to create this. And um, that is not something that easy to achieve as you, as, as you go into, into the creative process because it's, um, it's not a place that is so easy to achieve, but it, that is where you need to be to be able to, to, to come up with something that that will, will, will deliver in, in, in the front of what, what you're doing, you know. And, and for you, what is like, um, you know, the, all the guys I work with, you know, we, we talk about, you know, how to build up your, your, your social confidence and how to implement that in all the different areas of your life, you know, whether it be, you know, dating, your career, and, you know, just your social life. So, you know, is there any kind of a, advice that you could probably give, like, the people watching this on how you can kind of, you know, first of all, build the relationships with the people that you need to yes and and also how to treat those relationships how to nurture them and then how to then when you need something from them like go about doing that 
Yeah, I mean, I would never go there and, and I would never go and bother him, anyone with, with something that I don't think it's what they actually will appreciate that I'm giving to them. Yeah. And I think that's, 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 that's a crucial point that you, that you cross is like, I've done that with, with, the, with Danny Tenaglia when I think I've got a record that it's for him. I'll just call him, I do, I do the same thing with Pete Tong when I've got a record. I think he's going to like it, I'll give it to him. That, that happened a couple of years ago with New Lover. I had a record that I thought he was going to like it. I gave it to him and it became an essential new tune because I thought not all the stuff. That's one of the things that, that, that I came to the conclusion is that I've got a wide range of, of, of taste and, 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 uh, and genres that I'm quite happy to, 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 to create in. I don't like to be pigeonholed into one only compartment because I think it, you, can, you can go into a vast uh, that there's such a wide range of just in electronic music of things that you can create, but I won't be bothering people who I don't think um, they're gonna appreciate what I've done. I'm yeah. quite sure that there's no one that is gonna appreciate everything that I've done, but I know that ev every single person would appreciate at least one of them. You know, and yeah. that's kind of like I like that. I, I like to, to to always challenging, in, in, in to a certain extent. I like to to always move me away from the comfort zone and put me in a place that I'm uncomfortable. Yep. But that comes with a, with a lot of um, other, other, other issues, which you need, to, be, you need to, to have, you need to be strong in, in terms of your of confidence to be able to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to deliver what you're trying to do. Yeah. You know? And I think that, 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 is, that is crucial, but um, I'm not someone to stay in a comfortable place. I like always to place myself so in the place. Too if, you're, if you're too comfortable, that's a sign for you that, okay, I need to be... Yeah, yeah. but you need to be confident about what you're doing and about your, uh, as you as a person to be able to move in, in, in to place yourself in an uncomfortable situation. Mm -hmm. you know? What was the and first uncomfortable situation you allowed yourself to be put in? Um, I don't know. Um, I think uh, if I really think way, way, way back was um, I was probably in primary school yeah. and I recall that it was carnival, which is something that I don't think you celebrate in the UK. Carnival? In, 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 no, carnival, carnival, it's like, <laughs> it's carnival like similar to the carnival in, um, in Rio, where oh, you, dress, wow. you dress up mm. in, um, as pretending to be someone else, which over the years now there's a, a multitude of in, uh, uh, like not politically correct ways of dressing, but back in the day you could dress as anything. Right. And um, so everybody goes to the school, someone is, might be dressed as a, uh, I don't know, um, a gypsy, another one might be dressed as a, a teddy bear. And I wasn't dressed as anything, I just decided to make an R2D2 to come with me and that was my dressing. And that was probably <laughs> the first time I felt pretty out of place because you're not supposed to do that, you're supposed to dress yourself, not bring something else right. and I brought I, I built like an R2D2 with loads of cardboard stuff and I managed to do the the, the top of it by the Star Wars fans yeah. out right now <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and that was it that was the first time I've, I, I felt I think I, I remember feeling uncomfortable to a certain extent but that became actually successful because it just made everybody go like wow what, this guy's just nuts yeah. but that yeah that was the very that's probably Many years ago, this is like wow. seventy-seven, I think, seventy-eight. Yeah. What a reference point! Yeah, but and you just kind of say, took that as a metaphor, really. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, it, that's the, the earliest memory, but over the years, it's been loads of loads of times. Oh sure, <laughs> right. All right, so um, and tell us, like, you know, you mentioned briefly there that you know you you're interested in different kind of things, and you know, obviously, dance music for you has been at the forefront, and that's what you, uh, I would say most well known for um, you know we spoke about the stuff that you're doing for film now mm -hmm. as well so how's that going yeah that's going really well I mean it's uh, once again I like to, to to move away from from the comfortable zone and and the uh, two years ago I've just come across I was uh, for, for quite a very long time I've been thinking I'd like to do something where where I take a um, um, kind of a, a backseat in terms of, of the, the whole of the narrative so there is image is more important the acting is more important but I can still kind of like create and, and move people's emotions by, by with music which is what you do with, with a record anyway 
but by taking a back seat without being the, the main, the, the main um, um, character of of of, of, the, of the of the the, um, the work, and um, so I've, I've once again I bumped in randomly bumped into someone at a, a party in London, and um, we kind of start talking, and next minute he's just, he just he told me, well, I'm, I'm making a, a movie, and um, I've still I've got no funding, but I said okay. And would you like to do some strings for? Or would you like to do to do a, the, the credits? I said, yeah, I'll do the credits. So I'm thinking of doing like a like a kind of like a techno kind of Berlin dark. And I said, okay, because you discovered that I was a producer. So he's like, I said, I'll do something. And then by the end of the, the end of the night, he he he, he convinced me to to do the the whole the whole of the score. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> so so by, but so we met the next day at the Groucho. For uh, and he described me the, the whole the whole of the movie, which was incredible. I mean, just the, the just the, the the story of the movie, which is the, the, the idea is that the, is a, is, is um, storyboard is the Edward Snowman kind of type of character on the run from the U.S. government in U.S. soil. So straight away that clicked with me because I've always I'm always been quite um, um, ra kind of. Um, Anti yeah, not not <laughs> the most f uh, fan of establishment. I mean, always been never never really worked for a corporation, mm -hmm. um, but from a very brief period at, at my uh, as my first job, and then f after that I just quit and I've never worked for a corporation ever since with it as a job. So it's not something that um, that connects with me. I rather f I believe in other other um, values. Yeah, but um, so. He, he went away and he said, I need to, to raise some capital. I said, OK, I thought maybe this is not. Most films never really raise any capital. But eventually he called me and said, well, we, we, we raised all the capital and from um, some um, crowdfunding and we're ready to shoot. I said, oh, great. So they shot the movie, sent it, sent it to me just on the day that I was about to go on holiday to, to Portugal, to Algarve and to Ibiza. So I got all the, all the, the, the roughs. Uh, scenes to um, to score, and um, yeah, did it did it most of it in in Ibiza here, and um, and in in the Portugal at my parents' house in in the Algarve, wow. and that came out pretty good, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very happy well, with what it. What is yeah. the, uh, the name of the film? Uh, the name of, of the film is Trust No One. Okay. And um, you can actually watch it on um, on Vimeo if you if you search for Trust No One. From Simon Cassiadanes, and um, yeah, it's being uh, premiered at um, film festival in Los Angeles next week, actually. Okay. Yeah, June, beginning and of June. And tell us about um, Lisbon Kid. A uh, Lisbon Kid is um, once again another project of um, is a, it's, it's me and Danny Dematos, and um, I crossed paths with him a couple of years ago. He was interviewing me for a Portuguese. Um, um, magazine, online magazine, and um, I, he, he, he's also Portuguese, and we kind of like hooked up in, in, in Lisbon. He's got a place in Azeitão, which is a fantastic place for a region for wine. And uh, we drank. We know you like your wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like my wine. And uh, we kind of drank a few bottles of um, quite refined Azeitão wine, and um, we hit it off. And we kind of thought that there was. He, he, came, he comes from a background of. Uh, folk uh, singer singer songwriter uh, writing of songs for other people producing other people also some some uh, it comes from from a, a background of writing music for uh, for um, advertisement and um, i wanted to find another place where i can again feel uncomfortable and, and explore new sounds which you can't really do when you're just making club music and um, we decided to, okay so let's do an album and and then we did the album first, and then we took us several months to find the name, and eventually we kind of come to the conclusion that that we wanted to call it Lisbon Kid. Kind of felt felt right, and uh, we ended up signing to the legendary Wall of Sound Records. Um, we put put the record out uh, about a year ago, and um, it's now also available as an exclusive limited edition on vinyl, wow. which you can get on Lisbon Kid's Bandcamp. But um, yes, we're now in the process of writing the second album. Great. But it's kind of like Balearic uh, lounge electronic uh, with uh, with uh, a lot of acoustic, so electroacoustic 
music with um, with songs, a lot of lyrical content in it, but not necessarily with a format that caters for um, for radio with verse, bridge, chorus, verse, bridge, chorus. It's a bit free form, so it leaves leaves you um, more open to to creatively do whatever you want to do in terms of of um, of the of the songs, and um, but all it's got a lot of um, effort put into stuff that is quite syncable so all the songs have got videos that you can watch on YouTube that we created specifically so the whole the album has got 11 songs and there's 11 11 videos great yeah okay and where where is for you the the best place to perform yeah where's your well what's the best your your, your favorite place your favorite my, place to perform? my favorite place to perform as in as in the location or as in the actual venue ah both um I mean, they probably both exist in the same in the, in the same location, but it's uh, it's definitely Ibiza. Yeah. I mean, without any doubt. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple of serious favorite places to play in Ibiza. Some will be easier for you to come and see me play. Others will be more difficult. But um, a combination of, I think, the, a, a fantastic place I like to play is underground, which is um, kind of like off the beaten track bar club which is near San Rafael mm -hmm. which um, is not bowed down cool. it's called underground oh it's called underground and uh, it's never bowed down to commercialism over the years and that's not even to do with music it's to do the way that you actually conduct your business and um, I'm, I'm very fond of, of the people who, who run it and uh, every time I've got a chance and um, our schedules um, meet I, I come and, and play some records there um, other, other places that I've played over the years that I really like to play, so of course, is DC10, which is an iconic place in, in, in Ibiza. Um, Pasha, which is a legendary club as well. And then there is some private parties in villas and caves. That Those are yeah, definitely my, my favorite places, yeah. but I can't really say much about those. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> those, the, if you're in the know, you know how to get there. But it's yeah they've, they're very special for, that's where you, you gather all your friends and and you can really put, put your head on and just relax yeah yeah all right and now what i want is um yeah you're happily married yes for how long um i think 17 years 18 years something like that i need to count yeah but around there yeah yes thank you and and how how, how did that come about how did, how did how did you meet your wife um, I met her in uh, Portugal. Actually, she was working in uh, she was working in Portugal in um, Expo uh, in a bar, and um, she was she happened to be in another bar and um, having drinks with some friends. And I went there with the fr some friends of mine, and um, we kind of like met and we start chatting. Um, that night and uh, we then we carry on chatting and then we move to another party in some other friend's house and carry on chatting and then uh, it was daytime and she said shall we go to the beach I said yeah let's go to the beach so she was with another two friends and by then all my mates were kind of like gone passed out and said let's go to the beach and so I drove the three girls to the beach and we carry on chatting all day and that, yeah that was it <laughs> you move quick. <laughs> we don't mess around. <laughs> no, I mean, th th she didn't become my girlfriend, uh, but that's kind of how I met her. And right. then we kind of like were kind of getting along really nicely and, and um, just were friends for quite a, quite a bit of time. Right. And then kind of like I was, we were both coming out of a couple of relationships and we kind of like became boyfriend, girlfriend, but it wasn't never anything that was that that uh, I wasn't thinking of like this is it it was just like yeah maybe another day yeah uh, maybe another day and now we're like 17 years later we're still here so I don't know maybe another day I don't know <laughs> <laughs> 17 years is great man let's try to celebrate yeah I mean we we did at um, our anniversary a few days a few weeks ago yeah, day, yeah. yeah a few weeks ago yeah Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right, man. Well, I think that's about it. We've done, we've done the kiss and tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, but yeah, there's some, some great, great
great parts of your story in there. And mm. I really like the fact that um, that we got to that that that, that metaphor of, of of you know just practice being uncomfortable. Mm. You know, because that's where the growth is. Think yeah, definitely. It. You know, people, wh whether you're into music or not, it doesn't matter. Like you just take that and run with it. Like that's you can apply that rule in all areas of your life. Yes, definitely. I mean, otherwise, it's just, it's part of, it's almost like evolution. You need to, to, to get out of your shell to a certain extent. Yeah. And um, I mean, some people don't decide not to do that, but I don't think that's the way you, you have to deal with and handle life. You need to always get yourself out, expose yeah. yourself if you want well, to grow for <laughs> <easy> or <then>. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's uh, to a certain extent be a be a be a risk in terms of uh, of your um, not not in that not in that context, but it be a risk in terms of uh, you you move on from a job to another job, or you move on from being employed to self-employed. Always, you need to kind of take a gamble. Yeah. I mean, and I've always done that. All I mean, I moved from Portugal to to, to England Which is a at huge the time. Leap into the unknown. Yeah, and I didn't. Know. I was like, all I know is that I. My work relies on, and at the time, I had like a huge amount of equipment to make music, which you don't need now. Mm. Uh, literally don't need it, you yeah. know. And, and, um, and I brought all that with me. So I just can make music anywhere I want. I, all I need is my equipment. So I'll just put everything in, in the container and send it to London. You know, and just we, we arrived in London and we started right at the beginning. We, were, we had like a, a mattress in, in, on, on the floor and the cardboard... Uh, make up a uh, wardrobe to put our stuff in and then build from there you know from there and, and in portugal i was pretty successful as as a, a record label owner and a, as a as a uh, producer uh wasn't djing that that much at the time because i was super busy with with the other the other things but um um i took myself out of that comfort zone which a lot of my peers st still in portugal never never did i decided to do that and came to, to London and okay now you need to start all over again but yeah. how many times in, in, in your life have you got a chance of starting all over again and do it even better than the previous time yeah you know you need to move out of that comfort well I think I think yeah. a lot of people they think they've, they're gonna those people that think they uh, they've got uh, you know they need, they're too scared of taking a risk yeah if they actually look at their life They've got nothing to risk. Yeah. There is, the risk is actually not taking the risk. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, but yeah, no, I think people can get a lot from that. Well, thank you, man. Thank, thank you. Thanks, thanks for, thanks for, for having me. Time out. Yeah, it's been good.